Hello, and my name is Rory Griffin. My call sign is W4RJG. And I'm here with the ETO P2P team, and we're going to be talking about HF P2P call up process. This will be part one of three, and this part will be about the why you would want to do it. Now, who we are is the MCOMTraining.org, that being our website. We're also known as ETO. It's about supporting MCOM ham radio operators and their teams for the training and practice in digital emergency communications. There's also hosting a regular WinLink Thursday net, and the ETO PTP team supports ETO with the focus on peer-to-peer -peer operations. Now, the purpose of why you would want an HF P2P call-up is this. Any emergency communications plan should include when a spontaneous emergency incurs that encompasses the entire area. You get to define the area. It will be different from looking at it from a city, let's say, to the other end of the spectrum where it's a very rural environment. But spontaneous doesn't mean you didn't see it coming. Hurricanes, bad storms causing tornadoes, they're spontaneous that once they hit, even though you know it's coming. With that, when those emergency situations occur, multiple needs can arise out of it, but nobody knows what those needs are yet. ETO has already had exercises for such large-scale events. We've had an EMP strike, and we've had a meteor strike the planet. With the PDP aspect of all those exercises, it's included when any and all communication are impacted. Now the first responders can put out the communications trailers and trucks, but they would still lose their large scale capability in a scenario. And now that working with tactical, trying to deal with a strategic situation, it would overwhelm their communication needs. Supporting agencies like Red Cross, Salvation Army, a myriad of other agencies that we work and help with would also be impacted. And first, most importantly, is us, the amateur radio support groups, and we would also lose those same capabilities. Now, a real impact is that everyone in the most severe plans will lose cell phones and or internet and or the repeaters. And this happened twice in the same general area. Specific focus would be a square mile or so in lower Manhattan. Now, 9-11 has some unique damages and effects on that horrific day. The North Tower had a large antenna mounting array that was 30 stories tall all by itself. New York City lost the emergency operations center capabilities from that antenna loss. Later in the day, they lost their emergency operations center room itself, so all the backup facilities that they might feed information into was also gone when a smaller building, 7 World Trade Center, that later in the day collapsed. On that day when that 30-story tall antenna all of northern New Jersey State Police communications fell, as well as a number of other agencies that are not documented here. Now, when the North Tower fell, one beam that came off that came along, hit a Verizon building, which was north of the North Tower. It was an old brick building. The building wasn't damaged, but in that, it cut every line that went into the building, which was all the landlines in Lower Manhattan, all the cell phone towers, that went into that building, all instantly severed in about two seconds, and one second later, a water main broke, flooded the basement, compounding the whole problem. In the same area, in 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit the greater New York City area, and specifically in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, it flooded Lower Manhattan. The sea rise was so high that it just got into every tunnel, all the connections that all run under the street level, and anything that was electrical was interacting with the salt water because they just love interacting with each other. So all those boxes and connection points and everything were shorted out. Electrical power over in New Jersey was impacted by the heavy sustained winds that took down hundreds and hundreds, thousands of trees, took down thousands upon thousands of lines connecting electrical as well as cable as well as phone lines all taken down and hundreds of transformers were damaged if not outright ripped off the trees. Now with that long-term loss, cell towers and repeaters also went down. Not that they went down immediately. They did have backup power capabilities, but eventually that backup power would run out and if it required fuel, the fuel itself, you had to go scouring miles and miles away because there was no electricity for the gas stations getting gas and or diesel. All of this was from one storm lasting 12 hours. There are links below 
and in that will be some slides detailing all of this impact a little bit more. One's man-made, one was just regular natural events, and yet the situation created a huge emergency situation. Now in planning a response for such large-scale events, is that all communications lost, a plan is needed to allow operators to find each other all across large distances. It has to be RF based. You have to presume that your regular communications will not be working. The presumption is that enough operators will get up and running in short order with their own backup power system. And then a system being utilized to start getting some information flow as to who has and who does not have what. So in planning the response, a call up is needed, a sequence to bring all the resources, amateur radio operators for us, to the point of need. For those who know about ARRL, the national traffic system, their preset frequencies and net control operators. For the local areas groups, we have emergency operations plans and it lists what repeaters to use and some do have 40, 80 meter nets defined as well. There are other groups, Oxcom and other similar amateur radio groups like Saturn and Hurricane WatchNet. And everybody who has access to that emergency operation plan knows what to do. But keeping in mind, this is not a regular kind of a situation. Now, the AWRL and TS has a mature system, but it requires phone or CW for station to station operation. It has preset nets, and they can be brought up very quickly at a moment's notice because everybody who's involved knows where to go. With the VARA AC, which is a software package of digital communication. It's something similar, but it'll be using the same frequency where everybody knows where to go, and it's a direct P2P communication method, but VARA AC allows an operator to see who else is available. It's like a call-in process, but nobody has to be controlling the call-in process. Everybody just puts out the signal, the fact that they're there. The ETO PDP has developed a nationwide plan, and it can be used as a template for other agencies to define their similar call-up processes. A VAR AC call-up does not require any detailed pre-planning in the same way that the NTS nets do, such as who does what in any kind of a detail, just a frequency of where to go listed ahead of time. The plan that we're showing here is requires only one preset plan, and the first part of that is an organization of the frequencies. Possibly also is with that would be who should go where. You would be defining that for your own group. The band conditions, of course, being that this is HF based, would have the real control over that. There's no specifics of what to do when to get there. That would be based on the incident commander who or who's ever starting to leave the organizational process there. But the beauty is, with the way VARA AC works, everybody gets to know who they can hear. And they can do messaging of two types without tying up that frequency of starting coordinating some information, some general SIT rep reports, situational reports, to know what's going on for each operator. Now, in the event, as an example of a statewide disaster, it's causing a major communication disaster, preset frequency assignments can be used for any unit. The units can be an ARIES unit, an OXCOM unit. Uh, involving with your major non-government organizations as well as working with your government agencies and getting somebody to start working with them immediately and then combine any of that for what makes sense as the plans start developing. It's a flexible approach but it's using a built-in structure for what can happen when VAR AC is there when there are many unknowns needing some information and it needs to be done quickly efficiently and allowing an information flow without a lot of inter-operator interaction to make it happen. Now we've come to the end and we're hoping that you will see why there is a need for such a large call-up scenario. It's got proven digital modes that are being used and proven methods that ETO P2P has already used a number of times. You can see the links below for about ETO and about the slides used in this presentation. We thank you for listening, and we look forward to going into part two about how to install and to use VARA AC. And we do hope that you have a great day and you have good planning. Thank you for listening.